Hello. Welcome to Call It Like I See It, presented by Disruption Now. I'm James Keyes, and in this episode of Call It Like I See It, we're going to take a look at the supply chain and inflation issues, issues that we're seeing take hold in the U.S. and try to figure out if these things are short-term blips or long-term concerns. And later on, we're going to take a look at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's move to try to cajole food companies and restaurants to reduce the sodium level in the foods that we eat. Joining me today is a man who feels like busting loose. Busting loose. Tunde Ogunlana. Tunde. Are you ready for me to give you the bridge now? Yeah, man. I'm ready to boogie down, bro. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. All right. Now, we're recording this on October 18th, 2021, and I want to get right to, to this discussion. We have costs for food, energy, things, like durable goods, you know, things going up. It's taking longer for things to get anywhere and distribute it around. And there's concerns all the way that Christmas may even be on the chopping block here because of what's going on with these, these uh, the costs and the, the distribution issues. So, Tunde. What's your takeaway on what's happening in our economy with these supply chain and inflation issues, which you know could, may be related, as we'll get into, and how should we view this as far as what's going on? Um, I guess the takeaway is it definitely sucks and it's painful and it's real. You know, it's here. Um, no one can deny that prices have increased over the last short period of time, six, 12 months, that kind of thing. Um and I do think they're related. You know, the supply chain bottlenecks globally uh, have led to price increases, uh, and there's a direct correlation, which we'll get into. So I think I think it sucks if that can be my um, professional PhD definition. <laughs> um, but it's also like understandable when you look closely if one cares to look. Uh, number one, and not just kind of use it as another excuse for confirmation bias as to why they think everything sucks. Um, and also if just they, if they, if, if someone wants to look and then also understands the system. And I think that's what it, even preparing for today made me realize that we have such a global interconnected system that in many ways is very complex, but in many ways it isn't because a lot of it is kind of just pragmatic. Um, and just, uh, it's another example where I can say this led, leads me to believe that we had a well oiled system globally of commerce and goods kind of moving around that we didn't appreciate. Yeah. And with the pandemic, which I know we'll get into of March of 2020 and the global shutdown, that really disrupted things. And so, you know, we're still dealing from that. And, and the um, ongoing nature of the pandemic as well, particularly in other countries. Yeah. And and I think it's just, it's, it's kind of like the virus itself, right? It's messy. It's vague. People want to point a finger and hold someone accountable, but it's just just like the virus, it's global and it's just, you know, hard to see it all at once. And, yeah. um, and a lot of people have now put opinions and things in there to, you know, try and move the needle with an audience. So um, that's kind yeah, of what I, I mean, see the initial takeaway. There is a lot of disingenuous efforts to use this for, for opportunistic type reasons. But actually, the takeaway I have is also one. Uh, it's similar to yours, actually. And it's just that, you know, how you said it's a well-oiled machine. And what I see here basically is we have, from a cultural standpoint, an economic system standpoint, we have done a mad dash to efficiency at all costs. And, and so therefore, but there's two sides of the coin to the efficiency. How much should you value efficiency over other things? The, the one side with efficiency, which we've leaned all the way into and we've reaped the benefits of from a keep it, it's deflationary, the, the making things operate as efficiently as possible on a macro level. And I'm talking about the, the efficiency of a car engine, but just in terms of how the, the econo economy operates, the flip side of that is that with, with total efficiency, then one thing goes wrong and it throws off, it, it causes a cascade because everything is so, dip for, for the efficiency to happen like that, everything is so dependent on everything else. So the flip side of that is you lack redundancy. So when things are very, very, very efficient, things lack redundancy and one thing can go wrong, we'll throw off everything else. And so that's kind of the boat we're in. We, we've talked around this discussion sometimes when we talk about, oh, well, should we produce certain goods here even if 
It costs more to produce them here. Usually he's talking about it in the national security concern sense. But should we, even if it costs more, should we have it, a production capability here just in case something happens? And from a national security concern, we would be up the creek without a paddle because we've relied on this unbroken chain of 30 things that all need to go right in order for us to do this at the lowest possible cost. But if one of those things go wrong, then we just don't have it, period. And so that to me is what this kind of reveals is that, okay, and now if we're smart, from, if smart, we'll learn from it. If we're not just looking at like, hey, let's point fingers. Hey, let's capitalize on people being mad about this. We could actually look at this and say, hey, maybe efficiency is good. We should continue to, to try to explore ways to be efficient, but we should not do it in a single-mindedness way where all we care about is efficiency. We, like redundancy has value when things get messed up. If you have redundancy, if you have other options for accomplishing the same thing, even if it may cost a little bit more, then that will save you in those areas where you have one disruption or it's in something like this, like we're going to talk about, there's like four or five things that are, are kind of messed up that basically can break the system down. Yeah. And you mentioned something very interesting there, which is the supply chain deflation. Um, and that's true. And a lot of people, I think, don't appreciate that because it's it comes down to technology over the last hundred years or so and for longer, but let me stick to a shorter period of time uh, than, than going back to ancient history. But if you can imagine um, the cost to transport goods has con gone down generally and the risk to transporting those goods has gone down and I'll, I'll, and also of moving money and currency. So money is an interesting one. Let's just assume, you know, the, all the stories we know of of after 1492 when Columbus discovered Americas, which is another great example of how long the global global supply chain has been going on. Because remember, but I will say I don't know that Columbus discovered America. Uh, well, good point. <laughs> so I'm the, going on the narrative I was taught in high school. So oh, okay, um, okay. so um, so anyway, from the textbooks. So, um, but remember, he 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 got lost looking for a faster route to India because of the spice trade. So that's another example of just this, this global trade in, in commerce and in, in goods and services is nothing new. But long story short, we know the story after the, the, the Spaniards discovered the Americas of kind of the, the theft of gold out from the Native Americans, especially in South America. Imagine the cost for the Spaniards, the Spanish crown, to transport gold at that level in ships and all that versus four or 500 years later, we can push a button and money moves across the ocean on a computer. So that's well, a the, very- the cost, the, the cost to actually physically move it, but also the risk, because that's why there were pirates and all this other thing. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Because people were moving because, And that's a good point. When, around. When I, yeah. And when I talk about cost, because people don't understand things like the insurance industry, all that are hundreds of years old. So you're right. They used to insure these ships. They had to protect them with, um, you know, uh, military and, and, and other and mercenaries. So there was a whole, like, you didn't just send one ship to go get some gold and come back to Spain. You had to pay insurance premiums on it. You probably had 40 ships around the one big ship to carry the gold that was full of mercenaries and armed men. They had to go fight the Aztecs and the Incas and hope that they could actually come back. I mean, it took six months to a year for a round ship journey with all that. So long story short, today, Spain can press a button and they just made a currency trade with the country of Ecuador, Costa Rica. So that's just a very simple example of how the cost and time of movement of capital like that has 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 become much more efficient in a few hundred years. Well, but and to go to your original where you started, you yeah. don't have to go back to 1492 or the 1500s but I like to, to example that, it, to give this an example. Like this was going on in the 1800s. This was going on in the beginning of the 1900s. Like how to move things. Like the banking industry in large part sprung up to try to solve this problem where you could take money to somewhere and then they would give you credit elsewhere because yep. that was you deposited that money in London and then you could show up in Paris or in New York and they'd say, oh, you put the money there. We'll give you not the same thing, but we'll give you the equivalent value and so forth. So that's kind of where the banking industry came from in a sense. Um, and so to, to account for because that's a big problem. How do you move value around? But again, it goes to also the actual things, not just the gold, but if you're moving coffee or if you're moving tea or if you're moving sugar or things like that, physically getting them around. And to get to your point, though, the 
being able the container ships that we've used, the warehousing, all the the, the the speed of the ships, the security that's been able to be provided at more efficiently, all of those things cost much less than they now and have progressively cost less over time relative to the amount of money that you're moving around or, or the, the, the value of the things you're moving around. And that has had a del- deflationary effect that we felt but not appreciated. And so now that this has become disrupted, now that become this e- extreme efficiency and getting anything anywhere quickly and safely, this ha- has been disrupted by delays at warehouses or not enough container ships to move things around, then we're feeling that basically now because physically getting things, it, it's not with the money, but it's actually with the actual physically getting things around is all been jammed up. Yep. And, you know, as you, as you speak to that, I, um, I just, I, I wanted to cite a few things. Cause when we think about it, we're here in October of 2021, the pandemic really got going, let's say late February into March, 2020. So not two years, what is it? 20 months, something like that, 19 months ago. And so what do we have for the first time in world history? We had the whole globe shut down at once because like we talk about ancient history, or even not ancient, but just a few hundred years ago. I mean, the, the, the country of Spain wasn't communicating with the Aztecs to shut everything down at once. So this was the first time that we've seen that globally. And like you said, we had a well-oiled machine that was that basically was, was grinded to a halt. And then the machine didn't turn back on all at once with a lot of grease and oil. It has been turning on slowly globally with fits and starts. So what it's happened, easier to shut it down than it was, is to correct, start yeah, it back up. Yeah, of course, up. and start it up. And so what happened was workers were laid off, prices were slashed. Because remember, in 2020, companies had a lot of inventory, didn't know what the future held. If, if we remember, it was the first time the price of oil went negative in world history because there was just oil sitting on these container ships and no one wanted to take delivery of it. So the price went down. Um, then international factories, not only in 2020, but in 2021, uh, where most of our supply chain starts, uh, the manufacturing in Southeast and Northeast Asia, not only have they sh- been open and shut sp- sporadically due to their own COVID outbreaks, um, there's now an energy crisis in Asia. So they also have been rationing when the factories are yeah. on and off. And there's one so in that, Europe as well. It's, yeah, so I that think, doesn't help. You know, yeah, yeah, and there's also Europe's dealing with some natural disasters, other things, you know, you had forest fires, you had floods. So, so there's a lot of that going on on top of this backdrop of this kind of sloppiness of, of, of what's happened since last year. And then the other thing that we really don't appreciate in the United States is other countries have had an extremely slow dissemination of the vaccines. Um, well, we are very access, fortunate. Access yeah, widely that's what I was just going to get at. We're very fortunate. We have a few hundred million doses available within the first six, seven months of, of, the, vi- of the vaccine being approved. Um, a lot of other countries just don't have that that supply and so they they're they're still operating the way we were pre-vaccine yeah their and factories get shut down because of covid outbreaks and that's stuff what i'm like saying that. yeah, yeah. And that's that's all fits and starts and then there's also the biggest one which is not talked about as much is the shift in sub- demand from not only us but other first world consumers so remember these factories were set up to make in, in let's say the third world countries where the supply chain starts because of the the lower cost of labor um they, they were set up to produce a certain amount of, let's say, furnitures and TVs every year, a certain amount of vehicles, a certain amount of shoes, so on and so forth. Well, there's been just a shift in what how we purchase over the last 12 months because we're all sitting at home. So now, you know, there's a huge demand for everything from fertilizer to, to home furniture to outdoor patio sets and all that, which wasn't as much higher than it was pre-2020. And there's a lot less demand for things like automobiles because people aren't driving as much. So those manufacturing hubs also take time to shift how they're, you know, dealing with output and things like that. So, you know, when, to, when yeah, you, they have to adjust to that. Yeah. So when you really think about it and, and really peel away the layers, it's under, that's why I said at the beginning, it sucks, but it's understandable. And well, it's understandable if you care to understand it. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, yeah, if you're not trying to look enough, for confirmation bias that this is someone's fault, and I just want to the, point a finger. To the point you just made as far as the consumption habits, one of the things, actually, I, I saw this has kind of percolated up a couple of times in various ways, but 
you know, for example, I know there was there, there's been a tweet circulating that that a lot of these problems are basically first world problems. These are problems of excess, which kind of gets to the point you just made as far as like the shift in demand. And one of the things actually that that stood out to me about this is that that shift in demand combined with the fact that people saved a lot of money during the pandemic, apparently, this is by the numbers, people saved a lot. There, there's been reports Americans are sitting on like $2 trillion that they just didn't spend that they otherwise would have during the pandemic. And Hold on. I'll spend it if they need help. <laughs> Tell everybody well, to call me, okay? And so, but no, and so people are buying, like you said, different things because of that as well, because they're trying to make, they're trying to retrofit their homes to be better for work or for better for entertainment or better for exercise or whatever. And so these shift in demand. And so basically, it is in a sense kind of because we're buying a lot of, of stuff, you know, we're, because we are, we, you know, as American consumers, so to speak, and wherever, you know, first, any first world consumers, because we're, because we're buying a lot of stuff and we are, consu- or we're trying to, to, to fit all of this purchasing that we would have done maybe spread out over 18 months into six months or into four months, the existing supply chain, even if it was working at optimal efficiency, would have a hard time dealing with this. The, uh, Example I saw in one of the pieces that we they reviewed, and it'll be in the show notes, was that you don't build a church for the Christmas surge, basically, for the, the amount of people that are going to come Christmas. You don't, that's not what you build the, 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 the building for. You build the building for what's going to be there, you know, in a little bit more for every Sunday. And then you just understand that once a year, it's going to be more people than that, and you accommodate that. Well, but this is what's happening right now, basically, on an ongoing basis, because we have all this pent up demand. And so, yeah, it, it's like, you know, it's a good thing that the economy has hummed along and recovered sufficiently that people have money to, to buy stuff like this. But it's definitely a problem that it's then creating an overall tight issue because it, it this feeds over into food, for example, or energy, because all of these other activities require uh, the, the, the the things to go into it in order for it to happen as well. So like you pointed out the fertilizer, you know, fertilizer is something that's not getting distributed well right now, which affects how much people, how much food can be produced and so forth. So it, the ripple effects because of the level of streamline and efficiency that we've come to rely on when that's not there, the ripple effects hit everything. And that becomes unfortunate and that becomes a headache for, for us to have to deal with. So, you know, in, in dealing with it, you know, like well, how, how- one thing I want to add, though, just before we jump, because this is a good one just for the audience. The other thing that is related to this, not caused by the same effect, but I think adds to this um, kind of messiness is the shortage of labor. I mean, I'll just speak here in the U.S. I won't speak about other countries because there is a real shortage of labor at the ports and in the trucking industry. Well, but so, that gets to it because the we're having a surge in demand. Yeah, yeah, it's naturally no, that's going what I'm to saying. Be. And so, there, I think there's a, I think your point though, there's a shortage anyway, even yeah. from where we yeah, were. Yeah, there was a before. shortage of truckers before because yeah. young people, I mean, how many people do we know in their 20s and 30s that are saying, I want to go drive a truck? I mean, it's just, that's not something that um, society was really, you know, I guess, uh, grooming the next generation to be truckers. Well, we, because society's also been giving signals to people that that may not be there in yeah, 10 years. Also. So, I mean, it's trucks not. Trucks in the next 10 years. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, I, I just think, again, is that anybody's fault? No, it's just the way society's been going. And you're absolutely right. I've been hearing for two, three years that by 2030, up to 50% of the fleet of trucks in the US could be electric. So you're right. If I'm 20 years old, 25 years old, I'm not thinking about going into that industry. And then the pandemic hits. So, you know, I think it's just, that's why I say it's messy, but, you know, just once you peel away all these layers, it's like, okay, I get it. Like, this is not, this is, a, of course, this would happen. And, yeah. And, you know, so no, I um I appreciate what we had before this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it actually lets. You, but I appreciate it. But then I also see the downside to it as far as again that that, that total lean, one hundred percent lean into efficiency with no concern for redundancy in case anything ever gets disrupted or goes wrong. Well, but well, let me what? let me ask you this: the how concerned are you that these issues that we're seeing now, like you said, you can understand why they're here, but how concerned are you that they're going to persist and? Along with that, you know, do you think leadership is doing enough? You know, wh- whether it's leadership's fault or not, you know, like it is their job to try to come up with a, a response that utilizes the resources that we have available to us. So, do you do you think the issues are pers- will persist, and do you think that leadership is doing enough to try to ensure that that won't happen, so to speak? 
I mean, I, I don't know what leadership, you know, are they doing enough or not? Look, I'm sure they're waking up every day not wanting headlines to make them look bad. So I'm sure that they're out there, you know, trying to do something, right? Whether it's effective or not and all that, that's what everyone else can argue about. I'm not here to, because I, I, I don't know what they're doing, right, at the, on a day-to-day level. But I'm going to assume that they're trying to solve something. Um, and so, well, one of the things but, we saw that the, the ports now and, and a lot of the trucking, they're going to go 24 hours yeah. uh, a day. Like they're not going to just do normal work days. So that's, that's something. I mean, that, that well, is doing something. But here's the thing, because it's also the one thing is about long term planning. The other part is about continuity. You know, one thing I saw a headline I saw just a few days ago over the weekend, which was interesting to me, is that President Biden um, like signed to continue the tariffs that started under President Trump uh, against the Chinese when it comes to steel and aluminum and all that. And that's where I find it interesting because traditionally, anyone that studied macroeconomics um, can tell you that tariffs, international tariffs do cause inflation over time. And so, but that's not to say point a finger at President Trump or President Biden in that way. What I'm saying is it shows a continuity of I guess the American strategy for dealing with things like this, that even between two very different administrations, for some reason, this president said, I'm going to keep what the last one did because I see something going forward. Maybe the need to create more aluminum steel here in the U.S. So yeah, so they forth. may so, still. But and just to, so, what a tariff is generally. I mean, it's, it's a term everybody hears a lot, but I don't know if it's ever explained. A tariff basically is an import tax uh, that a country will charge. So we would charge if China sells, you know, aluminum for 10 bucks and, you know, we're say we're going to charge a 10% tariff on it, then it's going to be $11 with one of those dollars going to 11, uh, to, 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 to taxes, you know, to, to, to the, the government. And so it obviously would, it would cause inflation though, because it increases the cost beyond the, the, the cost that's being charged. And also what happens is then things we're sending out, other countries would respond and say, oh, okay, we're going to put a tariff on stuff of yours that's coming in as well. And so it leads to all this other stuff. And that's not to say it's good or bad. It, 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 it is a tool. So it yeah. could be used in a good way. It could be used in a bad way. But that's just what it is, basically. Yeah. And, and so the, the reason I bring it up is the idea of long-term planning for a nation. And this is where I think it's going to be even messier and more difficult to kind of just answer directly. Because it's hard enough to get a big country like ours um, you know, to agree on something and then do it long term, even through successive administrations. I mean, we seem to have, you know, wars that go nowhere over successive administrations, but not not real uh, positive things um, these days. So when, when I think of things like that, I say, OK, it's hard enough here domestically. Now we're talking about something that really does involve the whole world, you know, that that we really do have like we're talking about these global supply chains connected countries having to shut down and, and, and do fits and starts with their um, own manufacturing plants and bases because of things like COVID outbreaks and or, you know, um, electricity that's not, you know, efficient, things like that. So part of it is dealing with the global COVID stuff and just getting the world through that over times, dealing with the global energy crises that are there. That has nothing to do with just our country alone. So that's why it makes it difficult. And when I was thinking and preparing today, I thought of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Remember that? Yeah. Under a prior administration. And the idea back then was supposed to be, that was the, uh, the goal of having a long-term, I guess, uh, buffer against China's growth. To say, this is a long game of a decade plus to take manufacturing from the Chinese market and spread it amongst other Southeast Asian allies and also bringing it up on our side through South America on the countries that line the Pacific Ocean. So that would be, you know, the Argentinas, Chiles, Ecuadors, countries like that, which also have access to cheap labor. And what happens is you can't just shut down Apple's factory in China and reopen it, you know, in Ecuador tomorrow. There's a lot of skill, a lot of, a lot of time would be taken. You know, you could say a decade might be needed to, to, to move those supply chains. But what happens, unfortunately, is because that was announced under one administration, um, when a successive administration got into office for domestic political purposes, it was just, you know, let's just kill everything the last person did. And At least so, that's what it appeared like. It wasn't yeah. like when like when Obama put that in, there was pushback. And then when Trump came later, the, the reasons they gave publicly for, for getting rid of it seemed to be more about Obama 
and not about because it was something that from a long-term planning standpoint was a bad Correct. idea. Like, yeah, was, like there was like, no alternative. Maybe to they, with- yeah, maybe they did have reasons beyond that, but that wasn't how it was. Oh told. yeah. It wasn't announced that there was a, a grand alternative to in the long run in a measured way to deal with to address, you know, to address that ch- issue. Chinese uh, manufacturing being a, be a powerhouse. So the, I'll finish up here, but the reason I bring it up is imagine had that been nurtured and not jettisoned that right now we might have a little bit of easier time because we might have already had some supply chains starting down in South America, which don't take as long to come to China from China and can be brought not only through ship, but also easier uh, over land and air, you know? Yeah. So that's all I'm saying is that the, the, the pandemic is probably going to force some changes that already were probably needed when it comes to where global supply chains start. Well, I think um, you're saying hope that it will hopefully. <laughs> yeah, because, let's say hopefully. Yeah, yeah because it, it could it, break down further. This could cause society to break down further. I yeah, mean, this because, is we're at the uh, knife's Well, it, it goes to that same issue you just brought up where for domestic political reasons, people may not want to do things that ultimately would be good. I mean, they won't have a, an alternative. They just say, hey, I just don't want the other side to have a win. And yeah. so if, they, if, our, if our politics are that, basically, where we're just trying to make sure whoever we disagree with on this issue or that issue doesn't have a win on the economy, then, you know, like it may not, but hopefully, you know, like hopefully these type of events will allow the sober minds to, to gain increased prominence that may or may not happen, but you would, you would hope so. But I would say there's two things on this. One is there's the short term is the leadership doing enough. And do we think, first off, I don't think this is a long term thing as long as there is no additional intervening issues. Um, it's like we're trying to start an engine back up again and it's popping, pop, pop, pop. Like it's just until it starts running efficiently, it just takes a little bit of time. And then it takes a little bit more for the pandemic to recede and vaccines to get everywhere. It's always amazing when I hear about how, you know, in our country, so much of the discussion around the vaccines is how people don't want to take them. And in other countries, it's like, oh, we just wish we had enough of them. And that's like, that's your, that's, that's like, we sound like a spoiled brat, basically. You know, like it's people like, oh man, if we just had enough vaccines, we could get these factories going again. We could do all this stuff. But either that, that's an aside. On a short term standpoint, um, it's going to it's going to be bumpy, basically, according to every economist that I'm reading. You know, is saying it's going to be bumpy, but eventually things will will, will line back out into whatever that new normal is going to be. Um, you know, right now we just have to deal with its bottlenecks at several different junctions. And so once those bottlenecks work that work themselves through, which may not be till next year, but they will work themselves through, uh, then, you know, it, it'll be something that again, we'll go to either where we were before or some new normal. So right now I think the leadership has two concerns. You got into kind of the long term, and I'll talk about that in a second. There's also the short term, which one it is to build confidence amongst Americans, you know, and, and, and also to try to support where it can logistically, like some of this stuff, it's not like that the leadership can snap their finger and there's twice as many cargo ships or there's more ports or there's more people to work at the work. Like they can't just make that happen. But what they can do is almost on the margins, try to make the environment where you can make changes more conducive. So that is talking to the, to the unions, talking to the port operators, like, Hey, instead of going eight hours or 12 hours, let's go 24 hours. That will ideally help address some of the bottlenecks. So I'm happy that they're doing stuff like that. Um, you know, because the concern would be is if, oh, okay, well, leadership can't itself solve the problem. So then they throw their hands up and don't do anything. And so that would be where I would be looking at leadership. Like, oh, that's unacceptable. Like, just because you can't solve the whole thing, you still couldn't be trying to do things around the margins and make it better. So I'm happy yeah. with that. I mean, we'll see how, you know, like, again, it's working bottlenecks through. So yeah, go at the bottleneck, see what, if there's anything we can do to try to address the bottlenecks, do that. And, and then also talk to Pete, talk to the American people and try to increase their confidence. Interestingly enough, people who like we, we also see people, if you're out there trying to undermine Americans confidence, you're actually working in the it, against the interests of America, because confidence is an important part of try, us trying to get through this. So the well, voice where the dysfunction of our domestic politics could could hurt us, run the risk of making this worse. Put it that way. Well, but Just because, that's, that's the, the dysfunction yeah, that's of, the of our part. domestic politics are trying to make everything worse right now. Like we have elected officials trying to undermine the idea of elections, you know, like and then in the validity of our elections. So that's trying to undermine the government. So it wouldn't be a shock that you'll have politicians out there trying to undermine confidence in the econ- economy for political reasons. But either way, that is pushing in the wrong direction. 
you know, and I'm, I'm talking leadership. I'm talking about all elected officials, you know, like so ideally the voices that are trying to build confidence and, and build understanding and say, OK, we'll, we'll get through this. You know, we got to push through these bottlenecks or whatever term that they focus group and find is, is good. You know, it, so either way, now I don't want to belabor that, but confidence and logistics would be the short term thing. And so I, I am I, I'm happy with what I've seen um, in some circles and then in the circles, some circles, I'm concerned. Uh, Long term, it's what you just said. It's it's the the, the deals and, and thinking forward thinking like, hey, what are we going to do here? Um, are we going to come up with other alternatives so that the next time something like this happens, we have nothing to do? We, we're just sitting there like, oh, we're screwed again. And so. I, with that, we don't know. Like you said, we don't know whether the long-term planning is in place or is is happening right now that will put us in a better position to deal with these types of things in the future. Uh, but though, I think that's an obligation of leadership at this time as well. Don't just jettison things without a plan for other things to go uh, to, 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 to replace it or to improve things in the future for foreseen and unforeseen circumstances. Yeah. And my closing to this section is the good news is that because the price of food went up, Americans will eat less. <laughs> I don't that's, know if that's was, the case. They'll just eat worse. I, I was just thinking everyone's complaining. I was at the grocery store and, you know, the type of steak we like to buy went up like 100 percent. And I just thought, OK, I got to have smaller portions now. It's probably better for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Well, we'll see. I, I was going to ask you if there's any lessons we can get from this. So I guess that's the lesson is to eat yeah. less. Yeah. Yeah, smaller portions. It's healthy for us. Yeah. Well, I think I just kind of, those were, <laughs> I think the long term planning is kind of the lesson. Like you got into with the Trans Pacific yeah. Partnership. That was a good idea, or at least as good of an idea as anybody else has put forth. And we kind of scrapped that uh, for political reasons. But well, ideally, I'll say it is. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, ideally, that and other things, we can continue to have some level of forward thinking in in leadership, in the halls of leadership, to try to make our system more robust, the systems we rely on more robust, so that when disruptions inevitably happen, that we can handle them a little easier. Like some stuff, like the level of the bottleneck we're seeing right now is somewhat avoid unavoidable, but how well you can deal with it is something that is within your control. So I think that's the lesson really is to, to try to make the systems more robust, add more redundancy, as I was talking about before, uh, and it, it make it so that we can handle these things uh, more more effectively. Yeah, no, I just think that, um, you know, I think there's been inartful ways that this has been said. I'll, I'll, I think of, I think it was recently the chief of staff to the president tweeted uh, or retweeted something that was like, you know, this is all just first world problem stuff. And, you know, that, that does sound pretty tone deaf because uh, there's a lot of people out here that aren't having a good time that are making, you know, the minimum wage type of income that when prices go up, they really get impacted. But I do think there's many of us in our society that are, have been living well. And, you know, this is just a good time for us to reflect and, and appreciate that we've had a good run here. You know, this system has been great. This, this United States system that we've grown up in in the last 40, 50, 60 years, generally, I know there's a lot of people that have fallen through the cracks, but generally, you know, when I talk about we were losing seven, eight million jobs a week back during the um, the height of the pandemic, you know, we all thought we'd be in a great depression right now. And somehow, you know, the economy has been booming. So I think these are these are things that if we just sit back and, and turn off the TV and the internet for a second and stop listening to all the distractors and just look at where we're at, um, it's painful, but this isn't the worst that humanity's ever been at. So yeah, um, yeah. I think we can, you know, if we all, like you're saying about just, you know, not to be some kumbaya thing, like we all just got to get along and all this, but meaning if everyone just tries to tune the negative noise out and just keep going about your day, I mean, this stuff will, like you're saying, it will work itself out. So I, I, I think that... Um, That's an interesting point you raise as far as like we can quibble and I do quibble with how the spoils have been distributed. But from an economic activity standpoint, you can look back and say, wow, it's been pretty amazing as far as what the system that was set up was able to produce and provide. Like it, that's a the economic activity growth like that year after year and everything. Like, and again, that not to say that it was distributed in a way that was a way that was equitable or even sustainable, but yeah, I mean, so I think that, yeah, looking at part of lessons you may take is looking at what was done well 
and trying to figure out how to, to continue doing those things well and then see where you can do better and then, you know, try to add that in as you as we move forward. So, no, it's interesting, man. Um, now, you mentioned a second ago how you're going to have to eat better or, you know, eat, eat less because of the, the pandemic or at least of the, the your kind of guilty pleasure foods. So I'm, I'm sure you saw, I mean, you, you pointed it out to me that the FDA right now is looking to lean on food processors and 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 otherwise restaurants and, and things like that to reduce the sodium content in their food, the, the food that we get basically. And, and really, this is about the, the way the food is prepared, processed and or prepared. And so the, the high sodium content, the scientific literature has been pretty it has 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 been able to establish uh, negative health imp- implications and impact from the high sodium level of our diet. And the big notable thing here is that most of the salt consumption that we have not comes not from the salt shaker that we sprinkle onto the food, but actually it's already in the food. We don't even know it's in there already when we either order it and, and, and or when it's prepared at the restaurant or whatever. And so that's the where they're trying to reduce the sodium. Uh, content. So what was your reaction to, to seeing this, that that either that the, the FDA is not doing this from a mandatory standpoint, like they did with trans fat, but they are trying to address it, at least in some way. I thought this is great timing for another government regulation. Like I said, just <laughs> just when I can't buy enough food, I can I can now f- not feel bad about it because well, I, I guess I'm being told. If your steak is smaller, you don't need as much salt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're right. And then I don't need as much marinade that's full of salt. So you're yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, it's, it's, I think it's a noble endeavor, just like um, any time that any administration tries to do something to make Americans healthier, right? I mean, I, I don't think there's um, anything wrong with it. I think that um, just like in a lot of things we talk about, um, we as a society don't seem to be that educated about uh, certain things that are important to us from a health perspective and our bodies. And I think the, the amount of sodium that we take in is a good example and not understanding how sodium itself and, and excessive sodium um, leads to some of the most common um, health ailments out there like heart and cardiovascular issues because, you know, it can lead to high blood pressure that then um, it's kind of like when we did our show on sugar, you know, just yeah. like too much sugar can lead to diabetes and then the high blood sugar can, can cause damage to organs. And I think, you know, high high content of sodium does the same thing. It it just can cause damage to the body. And it's interesting because sodium is something as a compound that all life has evolved to depend on. Yeah, we need it to live. Yeah, we need it. And it's part of, you know, obviously part of nature and the earth. So like many things, just like too much carbon in the air for the planet, um, salt is not unhealthy on its face. It's just that, when there's too much of it, when the equilibrium and the balance that the human body um, evolved to kind of accept in terms of the salt intake is is thrown out of whack with too much salt too consistently, then you know, that's it'll throw the, your other, other, other parts of your body off. I just want to jump in real quick and I'll let you continue, but that's an excellent point because like without carbon in the form of carbon dioxide in the air, plants would die. Like, like we need carbon dioxide in the air. The problem yeah. isn't that carbon dioxide is in the air. It's that it's too much. And then the same thing with without sodium chloride, which is table salt. And, you know, like why we it's sodium is what the, 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 the biggest concern they're talking about is without sodium chloride, we would die. Like our bodies need a certain amount of, of sodium, sodium chloride every day. And we're, yeah. you know, at least in, at all times in our body. And so it, it's a really good point you make that the issue is overconsumption, not that it's existing at all. You know, it's, it's not a it's not a toxin per se, but overconsumption throws off the equilibrium in our body in the same way that over that the too much carbon in the in the atmosphere throws off the 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 natural balance that we've we've evolved to live in. Yep. And so the result of that, at least let's just talk about domestically in the US from our society, is an estimated four hundred deaths a year from salt uh, or high sodium related ailments, um, primarily heart disease, um, which leads to things like heart attacks and strokes. Uh, or sorry, heart disease doesn't lead to a stroke, but high sodium content can lead to strokes, which can lead to death and and just other issues. And then and then um, with an estimated cost to our economy of about a trillion dollars a year. So again, these are the things that are like um, 
uh, sorry, and I, if I said 400 deaths, uh, I meant 400,000 deaths. Yeah, um, so I, I can see somebody hearing that and say, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so it's just this idea that there's these, you know, silent killers in our society. And unfortunately, um, you know, we spend more time uh, on the more polarizing emotional topics, like uh, whether it be, you know, school shooters or people getting killed by police. And things that are very important. I mean, I'm not trying to diminish those important things. Um, but the idea is that, you know, not 400,000 people are dying from those things every year in this country. So it's another example that this sometimes the glaring things are the ones that we don't tend to focus too much energy on. Um, and the ones that are a little bit more on the outlier side get all of our attention. Well, it's, and, it's, an, it's an emotion issue because this yeah. issue, I mean, and I guess, you know, silly I guess of eating us, salt is an emotional good thing. So no one wants to stop. <laughs> well, I guess it's silly of us for doing this as a podcast topic because this doesn't evoke emotion, you know? So yeah. people are like, ah, oh, these dudes, I don't want to hear about this. But so whoever's still with us here is pretty cool. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Thank you. But the, it, it, but it's a good point though. Like the, this is something that is very harmful from a live standpoint, quality of life standpoint. And, you know, it, it's prevalent throughout society, but it doesn't generate the level of energy and passion that some of the other issues that may actually cost from a live standpoint and a financial standpoint as much on society. And that's not to say that those other things shouldn't get attention, but it should, we should consider that maybe we should give this one more, you know, because of that. Um, and, and from my standpoint, where I, uh, I what stood out to me in this was kind of that the FDA and, and kind of in science and so forth, the acknowledgement here that people will not be able to stop this overconsumption of salt voluntarily. Like they're just un unable to. Like you can tell people all the, all the facts you want. You can tell them, hey, this won't, you know, like this is bad for you and ever, but people are going to do it if it's available. And Part of the reasoning on this recommendation and what the FDA is trying to do is that if it, it, competition won't solve this because people will generally seek out the foods that taste that, that, that meets their 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 desired taste. And as if there are there's food producers and, and restaurants that have the higher salt content, they're going to be at a competitive advantage. And so therefore it won't work to just have the market solve this problem. So this is why you have regulation. This is why this is a, a scenario where the market won't solve it because of the way we behave. And so the thinking being that if everyone reduces their salt content by 15%, then what actually will happen is that our taste buds will adjust and we'll become accustomed to lesser salt and we'll, we, it won't reduce over the long term, it won't reduce our enjoy enjoyment in our food, but it will allow us to reduce from across the board. And if one person is doing it or if 50 percent of the people are doing it, then what may happen is, is that people may just a lot of people, you know, enough from a market standpoint, will just avoid those places and go to the places with the high sodium. So they're trying to solve it from a systemic standpoint, you know, overall and bring the baseline down across the board. And it seems like a good idea, you know, because if, if, the, if it's acknowledged that, hey, if high salt foods are available and you put them, if somebody has you know a pizza pocket on one hand and some celery on the other hand, and it's a, you're, you're giving people the choice on which one they want, <laughs> guess what? The market is going to fail us there. And yeah. so we need to do something across the board. So I thought that was, I mean, but that that's what we want from a, a administrative agency like this is to identify that kind of stuff and then figure out ways. And whether it needs to be mandatory or not, I'm not really here to discuss um, at this point. Like I, I think it's it's worthwhile to try to to, to get voluntary compliance at least. Uh, but if this is killing people like that, eventually we may need to look at maybe it, it, it didn't have necessarily not mandatory, but penalties or some other ways to try to really could do even more to control people into this. Particularly again, if if it's not something that the market is capable of solving on its own. Yeah, and I think um, it's just interesting because you're right. I mean, I, I when I see corporate America that makes profit off of selling products a certain way being asked to voluntary change voluntarily change i kind of laugh because i'm like well shoot <laughs> if i own general mills or or you know one of these food companies just pick any of them i don't even want to pick on them and i'm making hand over fist right now in the way it is why would i change well um, but that's kind of the thing you would definitely wouldn't if you're general mills you definitely wouldn't if kellogg isn't 
you yeah, know, like, exactly. like oh, that's oh, what no I mean. Way. And you so, know? and so it's just, you know, it's like asking, you know, it's like asking the fossil fuel companies to voluntarily just, you know, start getting off oil to deal with climate change. It's just not going to happen voluntarily. And that's just human behavior. So, um, I, I think, you know, without it being mandatory, I don't think it's going to have much effect because you make a good point that, um, unless everyone does it, um, the consumer will still run to the better tasting one, which probably has more sodium, which means that everyone else is going to still try and sell their product. So, but this is where, this is where it's just interesting because this is where the great tension in our country and our culture comes between like regulation and non-regulation, you know, free markets versus where it is the government's role in doing. Cause if one thing I could see an argument, you know, this is private enterprise and people can be, you know, generally educated about sodium in today's world. And there's, you know, calorie counts and sodium counts on the back of the packaging. And isn't that enough that an individual can make up their own mind? So let and me sell that. Um, let me sell that person well, some leaded paint or some leaded well, gasoline. But, but, but what I'm saying is then there's the other side that says, okay, well, it's hard. You know, salt is something that's addicting. You know, it hits people's brain a certain ways that the food industry knows how to market. They know how to hide it. Da, 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 right. And that's what it is. So is the role of a government when you know that something is taking the lives of 400,000 people and your citizens of your country a year that's costing your economy a trillion dollars a year that if this were able to be somewhat, um, dealt with and reduced that it would kind of grease the wheels of your society a little bit better. What is the government's role? Should they put a strong hand down like a China would and say, nope, every company got to conform to this or you're breaking the law and we'll deal with you that way. Like or a China do- would or like a European Union would. Yeah, or very, no. Like it's not like China invokes a certain like kind of mentality. But this is, right. you know, you look at the the, 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 the the democracies in various parts in Europe and they do this. A lot of stuff that we do well, in America. Well, when I lived in Australia, can't. for example, um, their McDonald's, uh, when I had McDonald's in Australia, you know, they, they didn't have a supersize. It just mm-hmm. didn't exist. And their large was the size of our medium. Mm-hmm. Um, they just had different portions and also they didn't allow their cattle to be raised with the same hormone and, and, and antibiotics that yeah. we do here. That's so I agree like, with there you. There are a lot of democracies that won't around the world that don't allow food to be sold in their country the way it's sold here. Yeah. So, but that's what I'm saying is that's what makes our country unique in a sense where you have this, um, uh, kind of the corporatocracy, right? Like corporate America at the high level, the S and P 500 type of, of, of power, um, is just as powerful as our government. And, and most nations don't have that. Their government is the overriding power in the nation. So, you know, I'm not here to, to comment on that, whether it's good or bad, because I'm sure it's got pros and cons. But I think that's what makes our system very unique when you're trying to have something like this, the health of the nation um, being dictated uh, by, let's say, a government hand. Um, you run the risk in the United States that that also backfires and that it causes resistance. So, because remember what happened when um, First Lady uh, Michelle Obama tried to do that thing about sugar, reducing yeah. sugar, and you know, a large portion of the country just laughed at her and made fun of it. And, well, but I mean, okay. some of that though, you it, it's there was a hostility to her, and so it's hard to separate that out. No, like, but that's that what I'm saying is that Reagan, whether that's what whether I mean that is that. In our country, the messenger matters a lot more than I think in other societies right now. Yeah. Um, and so, like, had this been a lot of other nations we can think of, even the democracies, not, let's say, authoritarian only, um, I don't know if the half of the society would push back just because the prime minister or just the president's wife. Yeah, reflexively. What, what, reflexively, where they were trying to do something like reduce sugar in kids' school lunches. <laughs> like, you would think that most people like, yeah, you know, we've got an obesity problem with 10-year-olds in this country. We should be doing something. But like you say, that, you know, there's an, an immediate reflexive reaction depending who the messenger is in our nation. And that's sad. That's what's going to hinder us going forward in the long run. Yeah. Because it goes back to the TPP, like we talked about in the last section, that it, it prevents us from long-term planning. And this could be an example of long-term health planning for our country. Yeah, it, it and, is. It know, is an example of, so, of long-term. Because you won't feel the, the effects of something like this like in the next year. You'll feel yeah. it in the next five years, the next 10 years. And, and so, also long-term one thing economic, that, like we say about it, it's costing us a trillion a year. I mean, are we bitching about how much money we're spending on infrastructure? I mean, imagine yeah. we save that money well, from yeah, just exactly. reducing sodium, you know? Yeah. Just like, yeah. So it's just, if you could we, cut these that are in choices. Half. 
Yeah. Yeah. These are choices we're making. Exactly. Or, or, and, and the failure to make a choice is a choice as well. That's kind that, of the that's thing. what the I'm saying. Make a decision. We're choosing to be this way and by so, omission. That's, and I that's would why say this. we have a podcast. So thank you, America. <laughs> the one thing that you said that, you know, like kind of just my final thought on this that I wanted to, to express is that the kind of the, the tension that you talked about as far as how, how much government intervention is appropriate or necessary in various issues being kind of a, a, a fundamental question that we wrestle with in this country, much more so than a lot of other countries. And some of that is the nature of the country. But I think a lot of times people do not contemplate the idea that the government, the way our, our, our country is set up and the way that most uh, sovereigns are set up is the governments are oftentimes the only legitimate counterbalance to big business, so to speak. Like big business would run the show, but for government, you know? And so big business would do whatever it wants to do. That very rarely in human societies, labor unions were, were temporarily uh, maybe 70 or 80% as powerful as big business for, you know, temporarily for 20 years or so. And that's it in this country. Not really, that doesn't happen much. But typically speaking, the, go- the, the big business will do whatever they will try to internalize their profits and externalize their costs as much as possible by and large, but for government action. And so whether, again, whether that's leaded gasoline or whether that's uh, e- emissions or whether that, whatever it is, they will try to figure out ways to make the most money and to externalize the costs as most. This is one of those examples where putting the salt in, marketing it in a way a certain way, putting sugar in, we've talked about in other conversations, um, they know how it affects our brains and they can do that. They can ramp up their prices or excuse me, their, their, their profits based on doing that, getting us hooked and so forth. And the costs of doing that are all external to them. They don't pay those costs because those are healthcare costs. Those are societal costs and so forth. So this is what government is for is to try to balance that out a little bit and say, well, look, you can't engage in behaviors. You big business can't engage in behavior. Cigarettes is another example of this. You can't engage in behaviors that are, while very profitable for you, put all the expense back on society at large. You know, we have to meter that a little bit. And so if government's not going to do this, then there's not much else for government to do in order from the standpoint of, of having a sustainable society. Because eventually the costs are going to overrun. They're, they're, you're, people, the, the, you'll have again one rich person with all the money, or, or ten rich people with all the money, and government, you know, like will will cease to exist as a form of from the people, and it'll only be from for to represent those ten interests. Or they could just keep printing money. <laughs> hey, that's gotten us this far. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that one. I'm just gonna have my hand out. Hey man, you gotta, go, you gotta think of think of the I'm little. I'm gonna go sit under a tree and watch the Blue Jays fight. That's what I'm gonna do. Hey, that's 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 that'll keep your mind in a good the, place. The that's older I get, the more that uh, I enjoy watching Ducks and Blue Jays. Cool. So, um, so yeah, but that's pretty much I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we can wrap up. We got a wrap for here. Okay. I, I, well, Tunde, I, I I've am, talked enough about salt. Let me go get some lunch. Well, I'll tell you this. I'm, I'm <laughs> just happy that we made it through without you telling us that we had to eat our broccoli. Because I swore that yeah. was coming. And one, either one of these topics, I swore that it was coming and we were going to have to eat our broccoli. But, you know, I, I, you've gotten you have, you're more creative. As long as you watch how much salt food. you put on the broccoli. Hey, that, that's going to be the thing, right? <laughs> so, well, now we appreciate everybody for joining us on this episode. I'll call it like I see it. And until next time, I'm James Keys. I'm Broccoli. <laughs> All right. Subscribe, rate, review, tell us what you think of the podcast, and we'll talk to you next time.